Hello, everyone, and welcome to Attack on Power Hour. My name is Brandon Levine, and I'm with Google Cloud Threat Intelligence Team, Uppercase. Today, we'll be discussing a threat group known as TF TA505. Thanks, for point, uh, and exploring their big game hunting operations in the context of their TTPs. Targeted ransomware deployments are the new scourge of enterprises across the globe. The shift to ransomware as a primary monetization scheme provides tremendous benefit to threat actors who no longer have to write up off upwards of 70% of their profits via a complex network of money mules and laundering. In order to maximize return on investment, threat actors now accurately orient themselves to their targets in order to identify those that are capable of paying. This means businesses, governments, government municipalities, municipalities, schools, and hospitals. This talk will be broken into four parts. It'll be context and background, threat actor processes, operational details, and lessons learned and takeaways. Let's begin with some context and background. They are a customer of Drydex, a banking trojan and users of broadly targeted ransomware families such as Locky between 2014 and 2017. They're not the developers of these tools. That would be Eagle Corp. Thanks Intel 471, Proofpoint, and the NCC for that disambiguation. TA505 moved on from bespoke banking trojans and non-targeted ransomware in 2018. They begin to favor more traditional backdoors for achieving access into targets of opportunity. Threat actors uh, iterated rapidly in both its initial loaders and secondary payloads. By late 2019, they settled on solely in-house tooling. They've been using the CLOP ransomware family since February 2019, and there don't appear to be any other users, so it's suspected that this is an in-house ransomware family as well. Since 2018, TA505 activity has led to multiple high-profile victims in the Netherlands, Germany, Korea, and more. Unfortunately, headlines really do tell the tale here. Ransomware plus data leak is a very strong uh, threat, and it is a natural pair. With some background out of the way, let's move into what TA505 TA looks like now. So credit to the French National Cybersecurity Agency, ANSI, for creating a great visual representation of the initial intrusion TTPs for TA505. So TA505 generally follows a well-established pattern in their initial intrusion process. This is composed of roughly five or six steps. A phishing email, social engineering, no exploits, uh, user intervention is required here. That attachment or link in said phishing email which then redirects to a legit but compromised domain, typically WordPress. That compromised domain redirects, usually with some embedded victim verification logic, aka a gate, much like an exploit kit, to a malicious domain. And finally, that malicious domain drops an office document with embedded macros uh, and binaries, actually. Again, user intervention as required. Just to reiterate, this diagram is only covering the initial efforts that TA505 goes through just to land on target. So now that we have a good understanding of the multiple intricate steps TA505 goes through to land on target, let's take a deeper look at how this activity actually looks. Here's the first thing a target will see from TA505 starting from the left. On the left, we have some German language spear phishing email. This is fairly recent with an HTML attachment. If anybody wants to translate what this says, uh, I don't speak German, so feel free. Uh, on the right hand side, we actually have the contents of the HTML phishing attachment that, was, that show an embedded link with a fake error and various non-essential padding. The only part of this HTML uh, file that matters is that embed source equals sign. And that is pointing to a compromised but legitimate WordPress site. Apologies for the delay. After a user interacts with the spear phishing attachment and goes through the entire redirection chain in the browser, a malicious document, typically a Microsoft Excel file, is forced downloaded to the user's machine. The user must then click on this very enticing file, uh, very enticing file, and enable content macros. 
which require two clicks in modern versions of Office, I believe starting in 20, uh, 2016, but I'm not sure when that actually started. The Lore documents have undergone various degrees of iteration to try and trick users into allowing macros. On the left, you see one of their earlier examples. Uh, on the right and in the middle, you see a more uh, sophisticated uh, social engineering lore, but the point is the same. The user must click at least twice at this point in order to get code ex executing. Thanks to Hatching Triage for the lovely sandbox report here. When a user allows the macros in the XLS document to execute, two DLL files are written to a folder in the app data directory. These are a 32-bit and 64-bit version of the same tool known as Get2Loader. This is TA505's downloader of choice that appears to have been developed in-house. Once the DLLs embedded in the malicious XLS document are written, internal logic of the macro determines whether to execute the 32-bit or 64-bit version based on the operating system. The selected DLL is injected into the already running Excel process in order to beat traditional detections that rely on parent-child oddities. We can see in the top photo, Excel connecting to an external IP as a result of the get2loader DLL being executed and injected. The bottom image shows the HTTP post body, which has been SSL decrypted, that is sent back to the attacker's command and control. So we see things like computer name, username, OS, uh, it believes the architecture here, so it's x86, and a process list. So not everyone will get this step, depending on what is sent back in the HTTP post body of the get to loader callback. The threat actors can decide to push an additional payload, which is their full backdoor, known as SDB bot. In this image, we see SDB bot establishing persistence by writing code to the Windows registry and adding an image file execution option to winlogon.exe. This ensures that the malware executes on every startup. While SDB bot is the main backdoor tool used by TA505 uh, at this point in time, the threat actors, when opting to interact with a victim manually, will typically use a more interactive implant such as TinyMet or Beacon. In this image, we see a, timed met, a signed TinyMet stager stub, which is used for pivoting inside a victim network and for various reconnaissance activities, including mapping permissions groups and privileged users. Many organizations assume that a signed binary is an indication of trust, that is false. A signed file simply means it is cryptographically intact. So you could have cryptographically intact malware, which is what you see here. And finally, we come to the end game. When a victim is considered viable and the manual recon and staging is complete, a ransomware pay mode is deployed, most typically CLOP. Here we see an example ransom note written as a simple TXT file, which pops up on the host after encryption has finished. This is a pretty typical ransom note that requests the victims contact the threat actor for payment and negotiations. Interestingly, they do not appear to set up accounts per victim. I don't know if that's still the case. Uh, I believe it still is, uh, but this can actually be noted in one of the later points in this ransom note. As a small bonus, TA505 is one of the many big game hunter threat actors that uses the threat of data leakage as a strong arm tactic to entice victims to pay a ransom. They threaten to publish files on a dedicated leak site in the event a customer does not pay. This tactic has been adopted by many ransomware families and has been devastatingly effective. Uh, this has not been mapped to MITRE ATT&CK yet, but I am going to work on actually getting this particular technique mapped to the impact section. Now that we've seen a high-level example of the way various TTPs fit together, let's discuss what can be learned by studying this threat actor. Complementing defense in depth with detection in depth is crucial to protecting a modern enterprise. Studying TTPs with an eye towards interdiction opportunities. Where should I see X? How could I stop Y? Should be your organization's plan when considering how best to use MITRE ATT&CK. Detecting the ransomware is too late. A long chain of activity preceded the ransomware deployment. And finally, attackers use a blend of tools and techniques. Open source or red team tools on GitHub are no less capable of getting the job done. 
and are arguably a higher ROI and significantly more acceptable, uh, accessible. Thank you, and I'll hand it back to Jamie. Awesome. Thank you, Brandon. That was fantastic. And I think one of the um, unintended, unplanned like themes of the day was the human behind the keyboard and how much that plays into these attacks. And I think your presentation here really kind of highlighted that with the optimistic like nature of it. It's like, you know, the, the initial access that you went through was all based on users, you know, clicking things they shouldn't you know, enabling things that, you know, otherwise, you know, defenses otherwise would protect. But what are your thoughts on, you know, as a, as a community, what can we do in terms of, you know, minimizing that? So like you said, the, the full chain of behaviors that kind of spun from that one bad decision, uh, what can we do as a community to kind of minimize the impact or the, the likelihood of that? So I think really uh, one of the main, main takeaways for me is that studying the way the TTPs fit together is of paramount importance. You know, um, and, and we've sort of espoused this idea of defense in depth, but that hasn't really kept pace with the concept of detection in depth, mm -hmm. wherein you need to consider how can I see this, where can I stop that, uh, and how can I stop why? And those are really critical questions to consider when uh, creating a detection program. And MITRE ATT&CK is a great guideline to help inform those, those sort of, sorts of decisions. Um, as Brian mentioned earlier in his talk, it, there is a lot of art, art behind the science and a, lot, and a little bit of science to the art. Um, but I think it is really important to understand how the big t picture really fits together because, you know, when you start to try to detect just that ransomware, you have missed, you know, five or six different interdiction opportunities. That's a great point. So like you said, um, plan for the best, but assume the worst and kind of like, you know, have know all the steps along the path that you could possibly interject and have a detection opportunity. That's a, that's a really great advice. Thank you.